Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, again, I'm Joey Lovestrand, postdoctoral fellow at SOAS, and today we're excited to have uh, Pai Sukumbu with us to share uh, about his work and his own viewpoints on uh, his work and how uh, we should be approaching uh, language documentation uh, with us today. Uh, Pius is a Alexander von Humboldt researcher at the University of Hamburg in Germany. Uh, his research there is focused on Grassfield Bantu languages of Cameroon. Uh, and this is an extension of work that he's been doing on his own language, Babanki. Uh, and so Pius comes to us with experience as an insider researcher working with uh, his, his own language community, the community he grew up with. Uh, he also has experience as an outsider researcher as well. He did his uh, PhD at the University of Yaoundé on Njim, studying the tonology of the language, the Bantu language of East Cameroon. So within the same uh, passport country, but I think culturally uh, very different from uh, his own homeland. Uh, and so we're really excited to hear uh, from you about these sort of variety of experiences uh, that you've had uh, and what you're able to share with us today. So I'll give the uh, floor over to you for about the next uh, 30 or 40 minutes and then ask people to uh, hold their questions to the end. If you do think of a question that you want to put into the chat, you can go ahead and write it there um, and we'll come back to a question and answer at the end. So. Pius, thank you for joining us, and we look forward to hearing what you have to share. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Joe, and uh, thanks for organizing this and uh, for giving me the opportunity to participate, and to share my views. And I wish to thank everyone who is with us this afternoon. Thank you for making time to join us and uh, yeah, participate in the discussions. Um, as, as we continue to look forward to a post-COVID-19 time when it will be possible to do fieldwork again and continue language documentation, I, I thought we could intensify reflections on how language documentation actors can contribute to the empowerment of target community members. And so uh, I would then be sharing on uh, if I share my screen, oh my. Yeah. Okay, so <clears throat> we will be talking on language documentation and the empowerment of target community members. And I would first of all begin with a brief introduction. Then I will uh, talk about the task of language documentation specialist. I'll talk about the objectives of funding agencies. I'll talk about the needs of target community members. Then I'll talk about, I'll propose a community-based approach to the empowerment of target community members. Then I will provide a brief conclusion. So, what is really the rationale for the for this this thought that I'm bringing for us to reflect on? What is the rationale for the empowerment of target community members through language documentation? What makes me think we should be considering this as language documentation specialists? I think first of all, if we have interest in language, it seems to me right that we should have interest in the speakers of the language. And I think if we have interest in protecting and preserving linguistic and cultural diversity, then we should have interest in the well being of agents of the diversity. Or if we have uh, interest in, uh, as linguists, if we want to develop uh, a career, when we have interest in academic and career development, we should think of the development of the speakers of those languages that we analyze and which facilitate our career development. These are the reasons, some of the reasons why I think we should be thinking of how to empower target community members as uh, language documentation uh, specialists. Now, due to the diversity of the audience, I would like to first of all begin by talking about the task of language documentation specialist. What, what does the, the linguist who engages in language documentation strive to achieve? 
And I, two main things, language documentation and language description. And regarding language documentation, we know the effort is to create a lasting multipurpose record of a language. And um, Hilmeman has put it very clearly in these words. A, a language documentation to strive to include as many and as varied records as practically feasible, covering all aspects of the set of interrelated phenomena commonly called a language. Ideally then, a language documentation would cover all registers and varieties, social or local. It would contain evidence for language as a social practice, as well as a cognitive faculty. It would include specimens of spoken and written language. So the language documentation specialist tries to capture as much of the language, as much of this as possible. Also, the linguist is interested in language maintenance. Yeah. So if so in creating the lasting multipurpose documentation, we see this as a major linguistic response to high levels of language endangerment observable in current times. So the process is meant to create important resources for to support language maintenance. Yeah. And also. Yeah, research economy. So language documentation and, and archiving creates data repositories for scientific inquiries. So as we do language documentation and archive uh, the products of our documentation, then we make available much data that other scientists can exploit. Now, language description is one of the main aims linguist and we know that many linguists do solid linguistic descriptions while others focus on theoretical developments. We also know that many language documentation projects produce grammars, dictionaries and, and so on. Also, we know that most languages, uh, linguists have the desire to make their linguistic products available to target community members. And uh, I have said elsewhere before that if linguistic research on endangered languages does not arouse interest in maintenance and or revitalization, or if research outputs do not actually reach the target language community, then the research has only been completed partially. So we have this desire when we do language description, we have the desire to, uh, to have the, the, the community give back, to bring back the linguistic products that we produce to the community of speakers we work on. And to, to see that uh, linguists have that desire for their descriptions to benefit the communities, I looked at um, some grammars on, of Cameroonian languages and I found uh, that most writers of grammars have the desire to, to see their grammars benefit the community members in some ways. And uh, so the grammar of Bafut, for example, uh, Tamanji writes that he makes the description as simple as possible in order to make the book accessible to all categories of language practitioners who are interested in the Bafut language and in related grass fields, Bantu languages. Um, I also look at the grammar of Babanki. I was involved in writing this. And we, we try to present it in a way that it will be useful to the learners and teachers of the language, as well as to others interested in this and other grass fields, Bantu languages. I looked at the grammar of, <clears throat> excuse me, of Mokpe. And at Tindobe 2013 hopes that the Bakuri children who are no longer speaking their language due to the exclusive reign of Cameroon Kuchin English as an unavoidable lingua franca of the Southwest region, as well as English and French as the two official languages of Cameroon will find the grammar useful. Uh, the Zadik grammar, Crane, uh, Hyman, and Kumu wish that the grammar will be of use to scholars of different sorts and ultimately the Zadik community as well. 
This is to say that uh, in writing grammars, linguists have in mind the community of speakers of the language they, they describe. And then the question one like to ask is, do these communities actually benefit from these linguistic descriptions? And to, to answer this question, I did a study and uh, I examined three main issues concerning the grammars of five Cameroonian languages. So I checked uh, Akose, Babanki, Bafut, Mokpe, and Oku. And the issues I focused on were awareness of the existence of the grammar. So it was, I, I sought to ask people whether they know that the grammar of their language has been written. Secondly, whether they have a copy of the grammar, if they know that the grammar has been written. And thirdly, uh, whether they are able to read the grammar. And uh, I did this study with 750 speakers uh, from these five communities. And I checked not just people in the, the community itself, but also in the diasporas, diaspora areas of Cameroon, where speakers of these languages are found. And uh, I found that um, of, of the 750 people, up to 59.3% categorically said there is no grammar, the grammar of the language has not been written, 59.3. And 23.7 people said they have no idea. And it's only 17%, that is 128 out of 750 people said, they know that the grammar, the grammar of their language has been written. So I asked the 17% whether they own a copy of the grammar and 89.8% of them said they do not own a copy. And uh, only 10.2% said they own a copy. And uh, a good number of these people had received the copies, the, the grammar from the authors. So it's not like they bought them, they ordered them somewhere. They received from the authors. Then I asked the 10.2% about their, their ability to read the grammar. And up to 85% of them said they could manage to read with a lot of difficulty because of uh, the tone marks, because of uh, inf unfamiliar sounds like the, the villa neza, the schwa, which are not found in the English language that the people uh, are, are familiar with. And only 15% said they could read with ease. And these two persons were actually. Uh, university lecturers of linguistics so they could they could read that is to say that the even though the grammar writers have the interest of the community at heart the desire to see their grammars serve the community in some way it really doesn't happen that much there are a few communities where uh, literacy projects are, are running such as Akose, most of these uh, figures here are a little bit uh, high because most of the people, the Akose speakers, where literacy work has been going on for, for several years, decades really, actually said they are aware of the work that is going on in the language and also of the grammar uh, written by Robert Hedinger. So next, let's look at the objectives of funding agencies. Yeah, the linguist wants to do that. What do the funding agencies wish to achieve? And uh, to do this, I checked the websites of a few uh, agencies that fund language documentation work. Uh, yeah, this is was linguistic webinar. So I began with the ELDP. And on the website, it reads that the ELTP wishes to support the documentation of as many endangered languages as possible, to encourage fieldwork on endangered languages, create a repository of resources for linguistics, the social sciences, and the language, and the language communities themselves, 
and to make the document, no, document the documentary collections freely available. At least it's interesting to see, of course, that the ELDP thinks of creating a repository of resources for the language communities themselves. But later on, we'll see how this repository is useful to language communities. And I checked the documenting endangered languages uh, supported by the National Endowment for the Humanities and the National Science Foundation. And their aim is to support fieldwork and other activities relevant to recording, documenting, and achieving and archiving endangered languages, including the preparation of lexicons, grammars, examples, and databases. I checked also the Foundation for Endangered Languages there, and the objectives listed to raise awareness of endangered languages, both inside and outside the communities where they are spoken, through all channels and media, support the use of endangered languages in all contexts, at home, in education, in the media, and in social, cultural, and economic life, monitor linguistic policies and practices, and to seek to influence the appropriate authorities where necessary, support the documentation of endangered languages by offering financial assistance, training, or facilities for the publication of results, collect and make available information for use in the preservation of endangered languages, and disseminate information on all of the above activities as widely as possible. Very, very lofty objectives, very nice. And, but the, the idea here is that all of these objectives, all the funding agencies focus on the language, they focus on language only, but not on the speakers of the language. Okay. And that's where I'm driving to to say that we should not only have interest in the speakers, in the language, but also in the speakers. Now, do language communities have needs? Do they have development needs? Of course, the members of communities in which language documentation is carried out have various development needs. Just that the list, it's, we can't, we can't possibly establish a list because each community will have its uh, peculiar needs. But we, we know, for example, that linguists always desire to leave something in the community. In a way, it's, it's a way of fulfilling some need of the community. So they leave something, either dictionary, grammar, literacy materials, and, and so on. And the linguist sees this as meeting the needs of the community, some need of the community by leaving something in the community. And, but if the communities, if they have development needs, who should be responsible for this? Who's, who's responsibility? If people have develop, development needs, then, then what? Who should be responsible for this? Should it be the, the linguist? Should, should the linguist who should the linguist provide for the development needs of the community while also paying consultants? And in some cases, it's not clear whether payment is really sufficient or not. But since the linguist gets to a community and in many cases pays the consultants, should they then bother any longer about the development needs of the community? And um, should, or should the funding, funding agency care about the development of remote communities where endangered languages are spoken? Should they care just about preserving the languages or should they, should they care about developing those remote area communities in some ways? And um, what, I, what I think in response to these questions is uh, for many, many, and, and I know many of, uh, the people in the audience have done field work in, probably in uh, remote areas. And usually when we see how uh, the communities are, we, we usually you know, see that people really have needs, really have development needs. And um, if, we, if we see this, it's, people cannot, 
people are hardly insensitive to this. You go see that there is some really need for something. And you see, in many cases, people try to meet the needs in some ways. You know, so even, even if it is not the direct responsibility of linguists, we, we sometimes, as we think about it, um, they will, we find possibilities to, to be able to, to help these communities somehow. And uh, how I think this can be done is through what I call a community-based approach to the empowerment of Aga community members. We, we know, you know that uh, the community-based approach to language documentation has been uh, is, is largely accepted as the best approach to follow because uh, it, it emphasizes collaboration between linguists and language communities. It encourages research on the language conducted for, with, and by the language speaking community within which the research takes place, and which it affects. And uh, Rice says uh, community based research begins with a research topic of practical relevance to the community and is carried out in community settings. Second, community members and researchers effectively share control of the research agenda through active and reciprocal involvement in the design, implementation, and dissemination. And finally, the process and results can transform and mobilize diverse ideas, resources, and experiences to generate positive action for communities. So the community-based approach is quite acceptable. It's, uh, and many people who do language documentation try to follow this approach, try to involve the community at stages of the research of the documentation. And so the question is, why should we adopt the community-based approach to empower target community members? Why should we do this? I think of, at least two reasons. First, because the outside linguist cannot always know the needs of the target community. Yeah, we, we, we can get to a community and really see what we think are needs for that community, but uh, finding out from, from the community members, we can be surprised that, you know, they list different kinds of needs that we did not even imagine. But also, even a community linguist uh, like myself will have only a fairly good idea because, in many cases, they also live outside of the community. So, in the last 30 years, I've not been able to live within uh, the Babaki community for, for a full year. It's, it's not possible. Maybe I would go for a few days, a few weeks, or months, a few months. And so it's the people who are in that locality who can actually say exactly what their needs are. And, um, but I know, for example, that Babanki people don't currently need dictionaries. They don't need language development instead. We need healthcare, roads, schools, and, and so on. And if these are in place, if some of these things are put in place, then of course, language development is seen, as, uh, is seen as a necessity because there is the people themselves uh, understand the need to preserve, to develop their languages, to maintain the languages, but also they have more current, more pressing current needs than uh, language development. So implementing the community-based approach to empower target community members requires that the, the linguist for example, consult community members to identify community needs. And then to integrate community development needs into the budget. So in, in, in my opinion, this kind of consultation should normally take place while the project is being uh, uh, drawn up and then the community development needs identified together with the community would then be included as uh, in the budget. And uh, then community members need to be involved in the execution of the project. 
and uh, the linguists who have to prepare and train community members to maintain and sustain the development projects after the language documentation uh, project is, is over. Now, I think also of the funding agencies. What should they do? And uh, as a community linguist and following all what I've said, I think that funding agencies need to allocate at least 10% of project funds to target community development. This is, uh, yeah, the proposal and it's, it's feasible because if the project, if the funding agency can fund a language documentation project for 200,000, 300,000, 400,000 uh, dollars, they, they, if the, the desire is there, they can have an additional 10% maybe for some community development project. Which, which will not, you know, it's not about developing the, every aspect of the community, but some specific aspect and 10% of the budget should, should go for that. And then the funding agency should ensure that grant applications demonstrate community input in identifying development projects. Just like they do when they find out whether there's been engagement of the community, in pre prior contact with the community and, and so on. And also they should request detailed reports on project execution and sustenance plans, just like they do when projects at the end of projects or end of a year uh, report on documentation progress is uh, submitted. Also the report on project execution, development project execution should be submitted. And this proposal for engage for the empowerment of target community members is, is not uh, something that is not, this is something feasible, it's possible. And there are success stories. There are success stories, which uh, I'm, I may not be aware of so many, as many as there are language documentation projects, and even those, in the audience today, I believe people have been engaged in empowerment of the community members where they do language documentation. People have surely been engaged in several ways, but usually they have to go out of their way and to look for funding elsewhere and so on in order to do this. But if this were integrated as part of the project from the very start, then things could be a little bit different. But there are some successor stories which uh, I could uh, share a few here. The first one I know because I, I was involved in this project somehow is a, a Peak for Peking initiative for the FAMCAM project in Lower Fungo, in Northwest Cameroon. This is a project uh, uh, run by Jeff Good and uh, Pier Paolo Ticaolo. And the idea is, you, you know, as you, you get to this community, quite difficult to travel to reach this area. And uh, so the road network is, is really, really bad. And, and uh, you get to this community and you see that there is really need for some development initiatives in this area. And then they ask the people, what could, what could be done to, to be of help somehow? And uh, the people say they need their children to go to school. They, they want education for their children. And there is a school building. There is the government maybe has said, okay, there is a school here, but they, they have not equipped the school. They are, they are not paying the teachers. They have not sent any teachers there or anything. And the people say, okay, if we are able to raise uh, pigs, we will be able to, to sell if we raise a pig for each child. So pig for picking, pig for a, for a child. If, if uh, they are able to raise pigs, they can uh, then sell those pigs and be able to pay teachers, be able to fund the education of their children somehow. 
And then this, the, the team uh, decide to, to try it out. And uh, I know that the, the initial stages were really successful, uh, but unfortunately the war that is going on in Cameroon then started and affected this area so much. And uh, the people, most of the people in the area, were forced to uh, to escape and to be to be uh, now refugees in different places. But because of the connection that the researchers and team had built with the community, they you know then go ahead to launch the Sunday Dress Funding Initiative, which again is to collect funds to help these people who are now refugees. So even though the, the project was kind of not running any longer, but the people, the project uh, management team still have the, the interests of the people at heart, they have this connection with the people and they continue to support the community somehow. So these are things that uh, if originally the project had budgeted for community development, these, these things would be easier to do. Uh, so uh, without doing any advert, if someone could you know, follow this link and support this initiative, you could help these refugees. Yeah. And also I think of the, the water supply initiative implemented by the Bezen language documentation uh, project. Um, Bezen, Bezen is also a very difficult uh, community, community locality to assess access it's very very difficult to get there and uh, a team of researchers we, we get there I was in this team we get there and the only source of water is uh, a, a river that runs across the village the river Katina that runs across uh, this area and this is where people get water for drinking for, for cooking and for every other thing this is the only source of water. And uh, for us, we have to go with, go with portable water from the city. And then uh, one of the project leaders, uh, Evelyn Fogui, thinks, but this is, this is really impossible. How do people survive without portable water? And then she goes an extra mile looking for funding to fund the water supply uh, project, which was eventually done and hand it over to the community. So community empowerment is something that several linguists uh, are doing in, they are in different ways. And the idea is if funding agencies can take this into consideration and you know, budget for community empowerment, a lot can, can happen. So with that, I will give some concluding remarks. First, to, to say uh, who really benefits from community development during language documentation. And uh, my answer is that the funders themselves, they do not only contribute to the development of knowledge, maintenance, and preservation of languages, but also have the opportunity to contribute to the development of the communities where the languages are spoken. Of course, uh, one cannot say why would they have interest in the development of the communities? Because they have interest in the languages spoken in those communities. Secondly, the researchers themselves would again not only contribute to the development of knowledge, maintenance, preservation of languages, but also to the development of the communities where the languages are spoken. And in addition, they will pave the way for future generations to access communities without any resistance. You know, in, in many cases, in some cases, a researcher gets to the field and um, people say, oh, there, there were some people who came here some years ago, collected, recorded things, and then disappeared. And we never heard anything from them again. We don't know what they did. You are coming again. You know, but in, a, in the event where there is at least some community project that was, uh, that was done for the entire community, because when you pay consultants, you pay individuals, 
it's not something for the community. You know, and the effect of the payment doesn't go to the entire community. The benefit is not for the entire community. And then people are kind of resistant when few researchers come to the area again. People are reluctant. And in many cases, then the researcher has a hard time and has to, to pay more so to get people uh, to accept, to receive them. But in communities where projects have been running, yeah, some project has been left by a previous researcher, people may even go to an extra length of asking, when are, you, when are you coming again? And you know, the people want researchers to come to the community. So running a community project opens the way, makes access to further research, future researchers those communities. So for, for the communities, as I said, uh, many communities, they, 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 they see some linguists as people who come and, and mine their precious resources and, and disappear, leaving them with, with, without leaving them with anything concrete. You know? But if a project is uh, implemented, then uh, it gives a better sense of the work linguists do in those communities. Okay, so uh, my final statement would be that uh, language documentation activities should include the empowerment of community members. Okay, so development products should follow a community-based approach to identify the needs, the request and allocate appropriate funds, and then execute the project. And this will make language documentation efforts more meaningful and beneficial to all involved. That is the funding agencies, the linguists, and the target community members. So with, with that, I will end here and then uh, uh, it's here what, what people think. It's, it's something for reflection and uh, for us to share ideas and see how we can move this forward. So thank you so much. Listen. Thank you very much, Chris. Um, as we wait for questions to come in, you can either write your question in the chat or uh, raise your hand to let me know if you want to ask a question uh, in person. You can turn on your camera microphone. Just to get us started, Pius, let me ask you a question uh, maybe about one of the less controversial parts of, of your proposal. Going back yeah. to what you started with uh, and looking at grammars uh, and the usefulness of grammars, I wonder if it's helpful to make a distinction between reference grammars as these uh, publications, you know, a book in a particular format, which we should be quite honest is fairly useful for the community of speakers. And I think that's that's true for, you know, English speakers and German speakers as well. These aren't, these kind of you know, publications aren't really part of our, our daily lives. Um, but, but can we distinguish between the products versus the process of grammatical analysis and the, the knowledge that's acquired or consolidated in that process, which may have other uses if it's directed in different directions and just be more frank about our, you know, our academic products may not have use, but the process that we engage in could have uses if we use other formats. Exactly. Um, yeah, the, I, I don't mean to say that uh, all the linguistic work we do could serve the community in some way. There are certainly uh, work that we do which which would which benefits the community of linguists, but not the community of speakers, because that will not make any sense to them. So, I, but what I'm what I, what I was really thinking about is, um, yeah. People may benefit somehow from, and I think there's a question from uh, from Julia in, in in this regard whether these communities can benefit from language documentation in in any way. And of course, of course, yes. People, there there are different levels, different kinds of work that we could do, uh, which would certainly benefit the community in some way. Just the, we know the revitalization efforts in the future would need linguistic work if, if the language happens to, uh, to die out. So it's really certainly of benefit or what we do. It's really beneficial. Either 
not even if not right now, but especially in the long run, in the future is be of benefit and the advanced uh, research in, into other areas of linguistics. So it's very useful what we're doing. But when we think of the immediate needs of the community somehow, this is where I'm coming from, immediate development needs. Um, yeah, so that's what I would say for now. Let me read out one of the questions that came in from uh, Lillianne, and then there's two hands raised from Jonathan and Luke, so we'll get to those next. Uh, the question from Lillianne is, uh, you talked about readable linguistic descriptions for communities. Uh, my question is, how could linguists write linguistic descriptions that are readable to communities and that at the same time remain scientifically of high quality? For example, how can we avoid technical terms like phonemes, elephones, downstep, etc.? Uh, that community members who are not linguists will certainly don't understand without the work losing its relevance. And, and Julia comments on that as well, wondering, you know, is it not better to have multiple publications? And I know you've worked on this a bit, trying to put together pedagogical grammars yourself. So how do you, how do you balance the academic quality and rigor with the, you know, ability to for communities to understand the actual descriptions, or do you not bother to try to to bridge that gap? What's your approach? I think it's it's quite difficult to write a grammar in a way that it will be useful to the, the lay person in the community. It's quite difficult. Uh, and in sometimes I think we linguists, we make that error of thinking that grammars are tools that should serve the community really. It's in many cases, Grammars would only serve the linguist, and, you know, maybe others who are highly educated and who can even read parts of those grammar. For most of those lesser known languages, the community members are mostly, they don't have a reading culture, or even if they can read, they will not, you know, no matter how you simplify it, you still, you still need training to read the symbols that you use and so on. So at best, one should dedicate their grammar to serve the linguistic community and then go ahead to prepare different kinds of uh, publications, different kinds of materials for the community, uh, simplified really materials for the community. And um, then of course, in communities where literacy work is going on, it's people get, people receive training to, to read and write the language, and then that becomes possible. But in most communities where there is no literacy work going on, there is no training to read and write, it's uh, really, really difficult. And we should, while trying to simplify the, the grammar as much as possible, we should produce different sets of materials for the community, yeah. Thanks, I'm gonna go to uh, Jonathan for his question. Uh, thanks very much, Joey, and thank you, for, uh, Professor Okumbu, for your very interesting and insightful talk. Um, I, I was struck by your, your call to um, funding agencies to, you know, you suggested building in 10% um, uh, component into the research budget. And I, and I suppose, so as a sort of relatively early career person, I, I wondered in your experience, and I'm talking from the United Kingdom context, but I mean, obviously, I understand you, you work elsewhere. Uh, do you, is it your understanding that funding agencies tend to be... Um, receptive or sensitive to, to those kind of budgeting requests. Um, often it can be quite opaque in terms of what funding agencies are prepared to fund you know, in real terms. And I wondered, uh, have you sort of seen some success with this with funding agencies that you've dealt with? And if you had any practical advice in terms of how you word that uh, in a way that they might be receptive or sensitive to? Because I think it's a very, very good idea and very pertinent, obviously. Yeah, uh, so far I haven't seen any funding agencies uh, that, uh, you know, uh, budgets for community development. I haven't seen it. And so to me, if, uh, if maybe somebody like, I don't think Mandana is here, but maybe she will get to hear this. Uh, she'll get to see this uh, discussion and maybe we can convince them that this is, this is necessary. It's not happening. And really, for those who have been to the field, sometimes they get out of their budget to, to just try to meet some needs of mm -hmm. community members. Whereas if this were budgeted, 
do make things easier. Uh, it will just show that we don't only have interest. The funding agencies don't only have interest in the language people yeah. people speak, but also in the well-being of the people. So, mm -hmm. oh, mm -hmm. yeah. I agree. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Lutz, if you want to ask your question, and then I'll go back to some of the questions and comments in the chat. So, yes, uh, very good. Um, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Piers, and welcome. Welcome to London, even though you're not actually in London. But um, but it's a great talk. Thank you very much. Very, very inspiring. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and nice just, to see you. Um, just a brief comment on the previous discussion. I think that's quite right. I think there has to be more discussion and change um of of the funding bodies and the agendas behind that i think it's a slow change but by you know by having discussions in the community and pushing people in that, in that direction um i think it's probably going going to happen um and you know i i think the big funders i'm not sure but smaller funders like you know there's there's a, a small a charity firebird i think they are called um they yeah. do language research as well but they are quite open actually to to community engagement more maybe than than big research funders um, but the question I had is, is a different one, um, and that is that is a you know a topical one. I guess it's it's COVID nineteen, and I was wondering to what extent you know your experience and what you're saying and your agenda and the points you raise um, are related to the current situation we are in. Um, the you know the background is I have a small project with a small community in Kenya that was supposed to meet with people um, last summer, and that it's a little bit like what you described. So it's from with community members. You know, they started the project. And then we met and talked, um, and I was very excited about it. And we had preliminary meetings, but now it's it's become very difficult because traveling is is no longer possible. But it's also in the community things have changed, and people have different worries at the moment. You know, there's the COVID worry, there's the economic implications, there's travel restrictions within Kenya, there's the public health issues. Um, so the whole agenda has changed a little bit, and and I wonder whether whether you know you have experience like that, and what what your experience of of that is, and also. Um, whether you think there's a long-term difference um, in, in the way we do linguistic research and fieldwork um, coming out of COVID and whether that has a, a long, longer lasting effect. Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you so much for the remark and then the question, uh, which uh, certainly we, as I said at the very beginning, uh, we look forward to a time when it might be possible post COVID-19 time when it might be possible to do field work again, normally, uh, it may not return to the, the way we knew it before. Uh, there's a lot of use of social media nowadays to do some sort of uh, data collection. It will be difficult to actually do exactly the kind of documentation that we'd like mm -hmm. to do if we are present on the site. So the wish is that things will return to, to normal, but uh, if the new normal becomes that we have to do more of social media documentation, language documentation through social media, we will certainly adjust in, in various ways. Uh, and what is sure is that communities face the challenges that you, you have raised. Communities even also have you know, these kinds of worries and a lot a lot is has changed not only in language uh, linguistic work but also uh, everywhere else and we can only look forward to a time when we will be able to do language documentation the way we can do it but when that time comes a desire a wish is that uh, funding agencies will uh, make it possible for us to be able to integrate community development into our project. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Liz. Uh, there's a comment here from uh, Owen. Uh, back to the question of uh, if uh, grammars are, can be made uh, readable. Uh, so regarding the 85% of respondents who found it difficult to read the grammar in Cameroon, were any specific reasons identified for this? For example, the grammar was written in highly technical language or there were low levels of literacy among the particular respondents. I think you've touched on this a bit, but what, can you go into some yeah. of the detail? Yeah, I, I would say um, th there is a whole lot of factors that come into play. First, people don't have a reading culture. People in Cameroon don't have a reading culture. Um, so uh, it's, you know, the, 
we have a joke that if you need to keep some precious thing near a Cameroonian, you better just put it inside a book and then leave it with them. So, but also um, people, the, the grammars, most of the grammars that we're talking about have been published abroad and um, they are far too expensive for people to try to buy. They are far too expensive. And even when people, if people had the money to buy, some, somebody in Cameroon trying to buy a grammar book from Rudiger Cooper in Germany would, would really not do it because it has to be done online or so. Uh, so not just that it's expensive, but uh, the practical part, the logistical part of it is really difficult. And then uh, people are not really interested in mother tongue literacy because in Cameroon, it's still the foreign uh, colonial languages, that is English and French, that are useful in education, also in administration and so on. And the local language is not, not uh, promoted by, uh, they are not promoted. And so people don't find any relevance in investing in those, those languages. So learning to read and, and owning a grammar of a Cameroonian language is not a priority to, to many people. Yeah, so this could be some of the reasons. But in communities like uh, Akose, Akose, where uh, they, they, they were, they have been uh, decades, decades of literacy work. You see people are really involved and know about the language and are trying to preserve the language because of the efforts that have been made, put in over the years. Yeah. Uh, we've got some uh, several uh, comments uh, in the chat from Peter Austin, so I just wanted to read a couple of those and give you a chance to uh, react from them. Uh, the one I'll read first is a comment about uh, benefits through the research process, as there are potentially benefits that can derive from the process, for example, passing on literacy and technical skills, like how to use equipment or generic skills that can be used in business or elsewhere. Also, if the researchers learn the language, this can demonstrate to speakers that the languages are learnable, interesting enough to outsiders that they want to speak them, as well as demonstrating respect and opening doors to better socio-cultural understanding, uh, let alone inter-speaker pragmatics. So there are just comments on how you know the methodology you choose could also have impacts on the community. Have you experienced some of that? I really, yeah, I, and I agree with with all of that. This is this is right. There are several other benefits that are coming, and. Uh, yeah, in many cases, uh, individuals, at the level of individuals, there are usually lots of benefits that language documentation projects bring to a community. You know, but when you think at a community level, you know, it's, it's usually, usually hard. Although an individual can benefit and the benefit can spread into the community, uh, but if if there is, for example, a school or or a health facility or, or something, you see this kind of serves a broader base than those benefits that go to individuals. But so there is a lot that people benefit from language documentation projects already. Peter, I have heard a bit about uh, other parts of the world where uh, communities have enforced this kind of collaboration that you're talking about. So he said earlier, indigenous communities in some places already have protocols in place, which mean that there is no alternative to what you're calling a quote, community-based approach, where the research goals are, stated, are established primarily by the members themselves. For example, Aboriginal Australia, First Nations in Canada. It is not a choice for a researcher. And he also shared a quote from the Vanuatu Cultural Research Protocol uh, with a link in the chat, which says that research in practice is a collaborative venture involving researchers, individual and groups of informants, local communities, chiefs and community leaders, cultural field workers, cultural administrative bodies, and local and national governments and must be approached as such. So uh, both at local and regional levels, there's been institutional requirements for this kind of uh, collaboration. 
Um, I guess you haven't experienced that kind of thing in Cameroon. I wonder what, what are your comments on trying to do that either at a local or sort of regional level? Uh, not very much of that. So this is uh, quite new and, and I'm grateful for those uh, examples, those experiences. This is uh, something I um, haven't observed in the Cameroonian setting. So this is very helpful comments to have. Great. Uh, does anyone have a final question or comment they want to make before we end this session? Well, I think there's plenty to continue to think about and discuss uh, and bring more people into this uh, discussion. Thank you so much, Bias, for preparing this, for sharing your experience with us, for willing to step out and make uh, calls for uh, changes as well in the way we think about our research and its funding. Thank you to everyone who joined us as well. Uh, thank you for your questions and comments. We hope you've benefited from this time together. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much, and thanks to everyone. Thanks for your wonderful comments. Thanks. Thanks, Drew. Thank you. Bye. Bye.